Dean Bethke. How are you, sir? I'm doing well, Derek. How are you? I'm doing well. I've been looking forward to this for a while. Um, I'm glad we could actually meet here in the Microsoft Technology Center and have you front and center, mostly so that folks that are watching could catch a glimpse of your magnificent beard. You did it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure even lions are, are jealous of you, my friend. Oh, well, thank you. It's, it comes naturally. Yeah. Um, so thanks for, for coming in. Um, we actually know of each other because on the data and AI team, I handle every aspect of how data is ingested by our customers and how it's stored and analyzed and how it's distributed um, through a lot of our technology stack. Um, and part of that is IoT. Mm-hmm. And me and you talk quite frequently, probably not frequently enough, um, about IoT and how our customers are using IoT. Um, and not only are you a, just a phenomenal storyteller, you're just a fun person to work with. And I think as folks will find out in the, in the session, you really know how to tell a story and you really know how to pay attention. And you just... You've been around Microsoft long enough to understand everything uh, in terms of a technology journey and how a customer should be consuming technology. So really happy to have you here today. Thanks for having me. Yeah. So why don't you tell us you know, a little bit about yourself, what you're doing here, what your mission is today at Microsoft? Sure. So uh, for the past three and a half years, I have uh, been an Azure IoT SSP. And in the Microsoft language, that means that I help uh, Microsoft customers and partners uh, across the Western U.S. connect their things in the Internet of Things to the native Azure services that support IoT workloads. Uh, and so that can be, and I, des- I describe IoT as really uh, connecting non-traditional devices. So non-phone, laptop, tablet, PC, server uh, to some cloud service. IoT. That's a, that's a, <laughs> so in, I, we're getting to a point, and I discussed this with your colleague Jeff in a, a past couple episodes, where it's such a massive buzzword today. Mm-hmm. Like, I almost feel like when you say IoT, uh, some customers just want to just punch you in the face. <laughs> like, cause it's not because they've heard it too many times, but because they're very frustrated uh, it's just a massive subject, and some of our customers have said, "Look, this has been around for thirty years. Mm-hmm. What's different? Um, what is what is the Internet of Things to you right. today? Like, what does that mean to you? And you're just breathing and swimming in it. I, I agree. It it it's three letters that can mean a lot of things to a lot of different people. Internet things. I mean, can we get more ambiguous? Uh, and I try not to talk about IoT. Um, I try to talk about uh, what is the business value that's going to be delivered by these underlying technologies like IoT and and AI. And so for me, that is how do we make physical things... one One of the ways I describe it is we can make dumb things smart and smart things smarter. So an example of a of a dumb making a dumb thing smart is a trash dumpster. Right? How are trash dumpsters emptied today? Either it's done on a regular basis or somebody's walking by doing a visual inspection and they realize it's time to dump it. Well, what if you put a sensor in that trash can or that dumpster to notify somebody when it needs to get emptied? I, I just described that in a way that doesn't mention those three letters, IoT. But we're making a dumb thing smart. We're helping drive operational efficiencies and maybe even providing an additional uh, revenue stream for the company that makes that dumpster. And then we also might have an opportunity to make a smart thing smarter. So lots of things are controlled by microprocessors today, but they may not be connected. Uh, the data may not be harvested and, and value derived from that data. So we talk about how do we make dumb things smart and smart things smarter. That's the way I would describe IoT. And I really like uh, the word play on, on the harvesting of data. And one of my favorite uh, little tidbits probably me two or three years ago i think it was ces 2016 Ginny rametti um ceo of ibm and i have a ton of respect for her um she said something that was just so sticky for me and i I keep on remembering it you know over the years and she said data is the world's most precious natural resource which i mean we hear that we're like disgusted with that 
anecdote at this point. We, mm-hmm. we hear it so much. But um, she mentioned that 80, 80% of it is dark, and the challenge is understanding it. Mm-hmm. And are it seems like in this world of everything, every dumb item becoming smarter and everything smart becoming even smarter than that, it seems like even more data is becoming dark because we just have we have so much more of it. Yeah, and and we aren't whatever problems you had with your data before IoT, it's going to just get worse because there's going to be so much more of it. And so what I'm finding is if you can anchor what you're doing with IoT around a data strategy, right? How am I uh, collecting it? How am I managing it? How am I putting it in context? How does that tie into the business processes? Uh, these are things that you need to do anyways. This is what's been going on with a uh, line of business systems for years and years. But now you just have additional signals that you can collect, combine with your other enterprise data and get value from. And and you come from the world of data, data mm-hmm. platform. I mean, you've just looking at your LinkedIn profile. I mean, you've had some really incredible experience. I mean, I didn't even know you worked at Oracle, UCLA, Walt Disney, all these ph- phenomenal places. And then you've been here at Microsoft, um, the data platform. You've worked here at the Microsoft Technology Center. Like, wh- like, is there anything that's emerging trends that you're seeing that you're starting to communicate to customers? I mean, hearing things like the intelligent edge, of course, mm-hmm. which has been around for a couple of years. Now there's this intelligent mesh mm-hmm. and all these different are these just buzzwords buzzwords like how are things evolving and how are you communicating those things to customers as they come up yeah i mean it, it's funny we see a uh we see this pendulum swing back and forth right when i was studying in university uh the model was primarily centralized computing on mainframes and mini computers and then the pc revolution happened and you had client server technologies and processing was much more distributed. And then now we go into cloud computing where things get centralized again, uh, but in a much more scalable, affordable way um, with more compelling economics. And, and now we realize, well, we data has gravity. That's what Satya Nadella said. So, you can't send all the data to the cloud. So you need the, you need to be able to do some processing at the edge and some processing in the cloud. And so I, I think what's kind of unique here is that we now finally have the, the management framework and the technologies that allow us to move compute to where we need it. Whereas uh, in the past, we had very specific tailored solutions, perhaps from different vendors that we then had to go through some very expensive integration process to bring those things together and to make them work well together. But as you mentioned, like with Microsoft's Intelligent Edge and Intelligent Cloud paradigm, we have co- these complementary technologies that are made to work together that allow you to consolidate on skill sets uh, so you don't have an embedded developer and then a cloud developer. You can take your cloud developers, develop compute, and push it to the edge, and then be able to move your data around in a way that makes sense for your business. And, and I like how when you're talking about the different skills based upon the different technologies that are emerging, uh, I talk to so many semiconductor businesses. It's part of I, I handle the um, the high tech manufacturing vertical, mm-hmm. so I'm always talking about to these manufacturers, these folks that are developing uh, chips, silicon. And it seems like they are, some of them are trying to move up the stack where mm-hmm. when you're talking about this pendulum and they, it's, it's becoming distributed once again and they're really keen on how do they develop um, these smarter chips with trusted hardware mm-hmm. and how do we do really cool things and process them whether it be image detection or object detection or facial recognition, whatever it is, but at the chip level, um, are you seeing, or do you think that's going to move back into the centralized computing era where we're going to build all this really cool stuff at the edge and on these different ships, but that's just not going to work out for us in a couple of years? 
Um, and we're and we're wasting some of these repetitions doing this. Us as an industry or as Microsoft? I, I, I think I think just in this industry. Yeah. Um, I I think we're going to continue to see a a blend. I mm-hmm. think the question is is who is going to be the arms provider, so to speak, mm-hmm. that provides these technologies, right? There's always this race to climb a stack, and I like the way you put that. You're you're trying to get away from commodity product to differentiate yourself and to be able to sell on value instead of on price. That's what Microsoft's done forever, right? We're trying we're actually trying to take all the commodity stuff away so customers can focus on what's uniquely uh, what they're uniquely positioned to deliver value on. Um, I don't know where those, for example, the, the chip vendors will fall because there ends up what they're trying to do is they're trying to do a lot of AI on the edge, mm-hmm. but there's a really long tail of what the workloads are, what insights you want to gather at the edge. So, so to create a smart chip like Tesla did to handle autonomous driving, they developed their own chip. Um, that's different than creating the smarts on the chip to do smart building work or what might be in a video camera or a sound recording device. And so are all these, are all these chip makers going to be in going beyond their core expertise in silicon and developing these very specific algorithms based on the particular workload? Or are we going to be looking at, you know, a, a software company like a Microsoft that is enabling frameworks that then can move that kind of compute, provide uh, enable specialists to create that that logic and then push that compute down on that device. I don't, I don't know how it's going to work out, but I, if I were to place a bet, it would be that there are going to be some very specific things that where there's critical mass, where it's worth it to be very specific, like Tesla's doing on their chip for autonomous driving. And then there's going to be a lot of um, uh, very specific areas that maybe don't need the specific performance that we have on with compute on a chip that companies might be going to uh, software companies like Microsoft leveraging our tools in order to then push that compute down to where they need it. So, so this idea of ubiquitous, ubiquitous compute where you can do anything you want on this framework or on this ecosystem, uh, it's because it sounds, it, it must be super hard for these chip companies to forecast what's going to be important to their customers. Like how do you stay ahead of what Audi's doing and how do you develop your chips to keep up with that market? Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know. I mean, I, again, I think that it, it's this long tail, right? Automotive is a very rich sector, right? Mm-hmm. And there's enough product moving through that it probably makes sense to do some very specific tailoring. But once you, you know, somebody talked to me this morning about uh, a particular application around golf courses. It's like, you know, that is such a specific use case. Yeah. Um, are, is there going to be enough investment in that area that you're going to design silicon around a solution there? Probably not, right? So where are the areas of critical mass that these companies cr- can create profitable markets or find their niche within these markets to, to make money uh, versus, you know, focusing on horizontal capabilities and enabling somebody else to innovate on top of that? I, th- I think that idea would have been a great idea maybe like a year before Tiger won the Masters. And then <laughs> maybe maybe you sponsor him, get him to continue to, to win, to get some more folks in, in, interested in golf. Right. Um, no, that, that makes complete sense. It, there, it seems like there's so much nuanced, nuanced instances where that could happen. Um, so I'm thinking about a story that you, that you told me and coming back to this storytelling. And a lot of times... We meet with customers and they just don't know what they want. I mean, it's such a mess. Ma- I mean, for me, even working uh, with you on a lot of cases, it's it's hard for me to understand IoT and and everything about it's just very complex. And I think it comes down to some of the stories that you tell um, because they're just really great examples of how people are using things, and it allows customers to start saying, "Hey, that's a really interesting use case." 
do, do I have any use cases like that? Or it, it just starts to bubble up some real abilities that they could bring to their business. And one of them um, uh, that you that you told, the connected cow. Mm. And you were talking about the connected cow. Uh, cow to these these executives of this customer and i'm like what the hell <laughs> like what is that even? and then i went and i i wrote a, a an article on, on linkedin and I, I found that story and i just did some research on it because it was super interesting just quickly um uh scr it's a herd management company um and they needed help understanding when a female would be in heat so they could be artificially inseminated female cow um based upon the number of steps that they took. Um, and you, you kind of covered that in the talk pretty well. But the interesting thing that I found when I dug deeper was that this idea of dark revenue, of the ability to do all these additional things with extra data that's coming in that, you, that wasn't even part of your use case. And it talked about, um, they, since they had this, this, all this data coming in about these cows taking steps, they were able to determine with high probability which calves would be female and for a dairy farm if you have more female calves and you're able to create more milk and then you're also able to figure out with high probability which females would be having healthy calves Mm -hmm. and that just opened up my world to um, you could potentially do anything so when you're talking about some of these different stories and the customers start to their eyes start to just peel back like what are you looking for what are you looking to do and what, what are you looking for and how do you just collect all that excitement and point it into a, a certain direction for them? I think storytelling is number one and just showing how um, companies are getting value out of the data being collected from through IoT in ways that people didn't think about and that the value that they're getting is solving a really compelling business problem that they can either monetize or they can drive operational efficiencies around. And like, I, don't, I forget the customer was, who um, I spoke about the cows and I don't, I don't blame you for wondering what the heck I was talking about, but coming to a customer, even from a different industry, um, but one that you can sort of get your head around, right? We can all sort of understand, uh, cattle cattle ranching right and and what's going on on a on a dairy farm um and when you can start talking about how you take a business process like raising cows and getting milk from cows one that's been done for millennia and now adding technology in a way that helps drive greater efficiencies um that i think speaks to uh customers and it helps them start exploring what's possible. And so what I talk to customers about also is there's this confluence of shrinking size of hardware, uh, increasing power, falling costs, uh, pervasive connectivity. We have way more ways of connecting things today than we ever have in the past. Uh, A democratization of more advanced analytics and cloud economics, all these things coming together are making it more practical than ever to solve some of these problems. And it's not that you couldn't do it before. Uh, it wasn't, it's not like it wasn't possible before. It just wasn't as practical. And so maybe somebody thought about, Hey, I, as an experienced rancher, I can tell when a, a cow is healthy, right? But now to sort of automate that and be able to do that at scale, across a herd of 10, 20,000 head of cattle like that, that is something that uh, is going to drive significant value. And what I try to do is help customers focus on what is that thing? What is your cow problem, right? Mm -hmm. How do you increase the yield of your herd? How do you increase the quality of the milk you're producing? Um, Whatever that problem is for you that keeps you up at night, that's what I want to help you solve through IoT. And it sounds like, I mean, the things that you see that a customer should probably have, you mentioned data strategy, um, you need folks that have particular skill sets that can understand these different evolving technologies. Um, 
your colleague Jeff mentioned, you know, having the business initiative and doing things really quick, just doing it alarmingly as fast as possible so that people, it could build excitement. It could keep excitement. Um, what are the clear differentiators between a project that just fails completely and doesn't pick itself back up Mm -hmm. and a project that is successful because it may have failed and then reiterated iterated and became successful after multiple iterations like what's what's the code number one is that business value i think if i see and just with microsoft right traditionally our relationships are with technical decision makers quite often we'll get brought into conversations with those technical decision makers around some iot type of workload or where where iot technologies are a piece of the overall solution and if we're talking technology primarily uh we i think the chances of success are lower if we don't have a business sponsor involved that can articulate the value and champion these this type of solution um we have less probability of success i see very few if any projects going from concept to production when you don't have a strong executive sponsor involved um, from the beginning that's keeping everybody on task Uh, because there's a lot of learning in these projects right a lot of experimentation and and you know there's kind of two ways to look at iot one is you know internal facing we're driving operational efficiencies this is going to help us do our business better like a dairy farm Mm -hmm. Um, there's another where you are looking to embed these iot technologies into the products you're creating to help you drive top line revenue uh, deliver value-added services to your customers and especially in terms of that product not only do you have to sync up with the product development, typical product development cycles that these customers have, which may be depending on the industry, these, these may be one to two to three year product development cycles. Um, if you don't have that business sponsor that is shepherding and sponsoring and championing this type of, uh, solution through that process over that course of time, it can lose momentum. Operational efficiency stuff. It's a little faster, But still, when you're impacting companies' internal business processes, in particular in industries that have very slim margins, like uh, distribution-oriented companies, they are very touchy about mucking with the supply chain. So, you know, if you don't have that that sponsor that says, we're going to do this and we're at least going to start and start learning from it, and seeing where we're going to apply and get value, um, then I think you have a lower chance of success. Got it. So the, the, the executive sponsor sounds like just critical. And I mean, for AI workloads, that's absolutely, absolutely critical. Um, and it sounds like the further you get into the edge. So, you know, typically what I'm doing is we're talking about ecosystems and software and services that help ingest data and prep data to make the entire data complexity and insight generation and model deployment, lifecycle machine learning model, um, AI development, just easier and to democratize that entire process. But that's, that's all, to your point, centralized compute. You can do that. You can scale it up. You can scale it out. You can turn it off all in the cloud. You don't have to own any servers or GPUs or anything to do any of that stuff. Um, But now it seems like the further you get into the distributed model, the more risk you're taking on. And it, do you think it's because you're moving away from IT and you're moving away from something that the organization has been doing for a really long time, which is buying software and um, whether it be an OpEx or a CapEx model, you're, you're just like now there's a devices and there's machines and there's, um, all these different things involved. There's new vendors and there's new partners. There's this entire like ecosystem. And is that part of the risk? Is that part of the, the hardest part about IoT and, and devices in, in a connected world, do you think? It's one of the challenges. And, it, and to phrase it simply, it's IT versus OT. You know, information technology and operational technology. And 
the way that we can think about, we're all familiar with IT, right? Mm -hmm. So what's new to a lot of the folks that we work with is OT. And operational technology folks are the people that are actually making the production happen. So it could be the technicians on the shop floor that make the robot arm assemble the car that's going down the line. It may be those engineers at a theme park that are making sure that ride is safe and reliable. Um, and traditionally, IT and OT have been separate worlds. Even though it's been technology that's been used in the operational environment, IT beyond, beyond providing network connectivity has typically not been involved. And so there's this confluence of IT and OT because OT knows the operations of the business really well. IT knows the technology and they have the experience with the data. And so now with IoT, you need to collect data from those devices that are in production that are helping you produce whatever good or service that you're delivering. And you need to get value from the data. Now the OT team has to talk to IT. And that doesn't always go super smoothly. Yeah. And and so what I've found also is, you know, biggest the, the biggest challenge in these types of solutions isn't the technology. It's the internal business processes and the teams that are working on these kinds of solutions and how do you get them to, together and on the same page and driving toward the same goal. In the in the operational technology, and I just in, in the last podcast, I think I mentioned the IDC said, you know, this year, 2019, line of business spending is going to be, the budget for line of business spending is going to exceed IT. Mm-hmm. And it seems like there's a big, there's a big center, there's something is going on where you have, maybe it's cultural, maybe it's politics, I don't know what it is, but what what's the secret, is there like a secret sauce that you kind of invoke with how to how to help how to be the the marriage therapist between IT and operational technology. I don't know that I've I've quite nailed this one right because each company has its unique nuances. Um, but I I try to help them. I, I try to help my customers uh, understand what roles they need uh, on the team in order to be successful. And there's an operational piece of this, and there's an information technology piece. And so to help them understand where they should be shaking hands and working together is an area that I can try to advocate. Hopefully the the patient will take the, the medicine, um, but help them understand now how do you how do you work together on this? And then how do we introduce a change management process that when there is new capabilities, new features that need to be rolled out, that that's done in a way that's acceptable uh, to the operational team and vice versa. When operational team needs additional information or value from data that they're generating additional insights, how do you then communicate that back to the information technology team that might be delivering that? So, a lot of important stuff here. And I think in when I was just preparing for the, the talk, um, a lot of these things were kind of bubbling up. And what really surprised me, and obviously you've, you, I think you begin most of your talks with just the sheer number. You know, I think Gartner is saying late last year, 14.2 billion devices in 2019, connected devices, uh, 25 billion in 2021. So many times the population on earth, um, which I think no one's, that used to be surprising, I think, maybe th- two, three years ago. But now it's like, oh, yeah, of course, everything is connected, including your refrigerator. Um, but what was really surprising to me was this entire idea of social, legal, and ethical IoT. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, I, of, that, of course, that makes sense when the world is concerned about privacy. Um, we're hearing about that in the headline news all the time. And um, this particular article I read, and I can put a link into the show notes, talked about data ownership, you know, analytical bias, um, privacy, uh, compliance, because these devices are bringing in so much data. 
And then further, and I think you'll enjoy this, uh, Nick Jones, he's a, a, a research VP at Gardner, and he mentioned this uh, successful deployment of IoT solution, solutions demands that it's not just technically effective, but also socially acceptable, mm-hmm. and that companies that develop this hardware are going to have to have third-party companies regulate and look at what data they're collection, collecting. We probably see this with ambient IoT. God knows what's happening in China in terms mm-hmm. of what devices, what kind of information devices are collecting. Like, is this something that's in your world yet? Are you, are you having to uh, be a practitioner to customers with these different themes? I do, I, and at least right now, because it's kind of the Wild West, right? We mm-hmm. aren't, especially in the U.S., uh, tightly regulated on these types of things. Um, I just read recently that the a military um, the military created a way to identify individuals using infrared based on their heartbeat. So they're able to track individuals based on that unique pattern of every of of people at, at a distance, right? So you may be giving away information about yourself that you may not even know. Um, the flip side is, you know, we've all been able to observe others out in public. So what is it that is about recording what you're doing in public is um, different than just having people there and observing you? These are things that we have to struggle on, right? And I, I work with my customers talking through these kinds of issues, where it gets into regulation and where it gets into their kind of individual business policies. There is one uh, customer, um, I, I can't say the name, I won't even probably say the industry, but they were using, uh, they're investigating using cameras to understand uh, consumer behavior. And in a way where the consumer didn't know that they were being observed. And so I started to explore to them, you know, how does this, how does this uh, relate to any kind of privacy policy that you or your customers may have? Because this, cust- this, this customer of mine is a supplier of solutions to a particular industry. And they said, if you look at, when you go into the, the facilities of their customers, you look at uh, what the privacy policies that they have, um, it's very clear what they have, but we just don't know we're entering into that agreement with that end customer, right? So the good thing is that they have a policy. The mm-hmm. bad thing is that they don't do a great job of informing people that they're basically giving up their rights and these things are going to be leveraged. So I think you know there's lots of talk about um, doing a GDPR type of um, policy here in the United States or in different states within the country like California. Mm-hmm. Um, but I, we do have to um, explore that. And what I find a bit unsettling as a consumer is when my behavior is being tracked and I'm not aware of it, right? The, and, and it happens when it happens on the web when we're browsing. It happens when we, we walk into a lot of physical places like uh, a store environment, um, and it will happen in other places as well. And that's an interesting concept when when you're when you're just discussing what's the difference between. I mean, you know, we all have different measures of social IQ, and when you walk into a room and you scan a room, I, I mean, your your brain is has a, a particular schema for how it looks at data and you're making judgments and you're it's all based on, on data like you're trying to figure out who who you know who you don't know is there someone important in the room you need to talk to what's the comfortability level of, of the room i mean it's, it's you're essentially a computer in this room and now with you know beacon technology i can turn on my on my link my linkedin beacon and start adding everybody in the room it's just like this this crazy uh mixture of technology and and social aptitude that's happening in one place and like you're right why is it bad to record it and essentially use a machine to see if there's any patterns that we just can't obs- maybe some people can observe yeah um who are smart enough to do that so just taking a step back um what are you know how do you learn 
I'm I'm very interested in, in in learning how people learn, especially technologists have been doing this for a while. Um, you've been at every single cycle of the pendulum. Um, you've done stuff with ERP and CRM, the data platform. Now you're in this world of IoT, very deep into this world of IoT, which is changing by the day. And then you also have to understand the AI components, hardware components. There's different partners you have to to bring in. I mean, te- customers of all different different shapes and sizes, from Carlsberg, who is distrib- distributing some of the most wonderful liquid in the world, mm-hmm. to you know these connected cows. Like, what's your what's your learning strategy for staying up and and being able to just be the practitioner in yeah. the field? You know, there's um, I learn best by reading and listening, and so. There are all sorts of things on my newsfeed about around IoT and technology in general. Um, but just being in the role that I am in, IoT sits at the center. Maybe it's a little myopic to say it sits in the center, but um, it touches a lot of other technologies. And, and that's where I can deliver value for my customers. So, for example, it's not just connecting things to Azure in our case. Uh, I have to help my customers understand what are the hardware possibilities. If they have a dumb thing and they want to make it smart, we got to add some compute, some device that's going to make that dumb thing smart. Uh, Then we've got to enable uh, communications from that device up to the cloud. And there's a whole bunch of different, as I mentioned, there's a bunch of different options that we have today. And so to understand what those things are. And then there's the, then there is, you know, what is that payload? And then how are we getting value out of it? Um, and then how does that data then integrate with the other business systems that we have? How does it integrate with a CRM system or a field service system? How does it integrate with the ERP or an MES? Uh, those are all things that I think, you know, not only do I read and listen to others and how they're describing it, but it's just jumping in and learning, right? And not being afraid to ask questions, even what might seem like a dumb question. Uh, but I feel like I, I kind of got uniquely prepared from this because, um, or prepared for this because my background was primarily in data and data warehousing. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was always in, in a position to have to understand data and help my internal customers get value from it. And then when you start working with line of business systems, you know, selling the Microsoft data platform, right? You're essentially... Uh, going to find a partner that has an LOB solution that is based on our data platform and then go sell with that line of business partner. And then ERP, which touches you know nearly every business process within a customer, and then CRM and field service. It, it's helped me kind of build this base of experience that then I can leverage. And so every new piece of information that I learn is just building on top of other experiences that I've had. And I, I mean, I completely agree. That makes you so uniquely qualified to pursue all these opportunities. I mean, I come to you for things that have nothing to do with IoT, but we're talking data strategy and where the, where the data is being harnessed and you have a perspective on that. And I'm sure all those different perspectives in this composite, they just help, they just help bring more uh, data to the customer and interesting perspective to the customer. Yeah. Well, and, and, you know, at us as salespeople, right. Um, <laughs> we're not super deep, in any technology, mm-hmm. uh, but just like any of our technical colleagues or you know any anyone anywhere, you have a there's a level of depth that you have. There's a core expertise that you have, and then there's kind of long tails in terms of what else you know. As a, in my role, I'm I try to keep extending my 100 200 level knowledge and being very selective where I can invest my time mm-hmm. to build the 300 400 level of of knowledge. But if I'm I'm focusing on that 100, 200 level uh, knowledge, and then being able on on business topics, business process, how do I bring business value? And then we have fortunately really great technical colleagues mm-hmm. that can go deep in any particular technology area. Um, that's helpful. And then of course, you know, we get to learn from all of them. Yeah. So do you make that assessment? And thank you for like the the mental visual. Do you make that assessment when you approach, like your your role or your career? Like, okay, do you, are you do you take a step back and say, okay, 
this is kind of where the industry is going. These are the gaps I see that'd be best for the customer, for me, or for the, my career. I need to get deep in these different tranches. But there's other other areas where maybe I don't need to be as deep because people can be, like what is that? What does that look like um, when yeah. you make that assessment? I, I I what I look at is kind of where is their critical mass in terms of business challenges, right? So um, key industries that we work with, right? Uh, manufacturing is a big one, and IoT where there where there's critical mass in IoT is in manufacturing, either driving operational efficiencies in a manufacturing process or manufacturing smart things that then become IOT devices. Uh, and so that's an area that I specialize in. And then of course my background in ERP, a lot of our targets for manufacturers, um, that was helpful. Then the second is retail because that's where I probably have the second best opportunity and retailers love to work with Microsoft. Yeah. Um, and maybe a little less so with some particular competitors of ours. Definitely. So that's, that's where I kind of spend time, um, in the retail industry. And then there's a, a whole bunch of different use case, smart cities, for example, those are prime for IOT type of solutions, transportation, um, the more different things that are out there moving around mm -hmm. where we have to deal with transportation logistics, uh, we can add value with IOT solutions. So I kind of look at where the market opportunity is, uh, for me, where there are big compelling business problems to be solved and spend maybe a little more of my time in those. Thanks for that, Dean. Um, so we're, we're about to come up on our time, but I, I can't let you get away without at least telling us one of your favorite stories that really showcases the value of why businesses should be um, taking a look at a their data strategy how they should be approaching iot any anything that you think is helpful for people who are wondering what to do next yeah i mean i i think about there's a couple of manufacturing examples right mm -hmm. we have and microsoft has lots of great uh, white papers and case studies on our website. There's a couple that I talk about most often, and um, maybe you you hear them all the time, and you might get tired of them, right? But sometimes our our customers, because it's a new customer, they might not have heard it. Mm -hmm. uh, is one of them is with uh, Hershey's, so they one of the delicious products they make are Twizzlers, and what is kind of challenging around creating a product like Twizzlers is that every piece of licorice is not always the exact same weight. You, we kind of maybe take that for granted, right? Because we might buy a package that has 16 ounces of Twizzlers in it. But if during the manufacturing process, uh, Hershey's is putting that last piece of licorice in that 16 ounce box. Um, and they realize the total weight of that box now is going to be 16.2 ounces. They're not going to cut the licorice in half to give you exactly 16 ounces they're going to give you 16.2 ounces. They're not going to totally not put that piece of licorice in because now you're going to be under 16 ounces and now they can run into all legal problems because they're mm -hmm. not delivering the promised weight. But you got to look at that extra two ounces or 0.2 ounces as a, a cost for Hershey's that they could save money on. And in food products, uh, in C these are, you know, you can have pretty thin margins. So, in um, Hershey's case, every additional half ounce of Twizzlers, I think it was something like $500,000 a year for them. So if they could shave off a half ounce, not just a half ounce out of the package, but a half ounce of overage, a uh, half percent of on the overage, that would mean half a million dollars to their, their bottom line every year. And so what Microsoft did with them was we analyzed their manufacturing process. We looked at all of the data that's coming off their, their machines and we were trying to predict the final weight of the package of Twizzlers. And we couldn't quite do it with the data we had. We end up in, including or instrumenting the uh, machine that was producing the Twizzlers with some additional sensors. And it turns out that by more closely monitoring the temperature of the extruder, because the extruder is the thing that takes the goo and squeezes it into the form that becomes the Twizzler, uh, we could better predict the final weight 
of the package and then now provide real-time feedback to the operators so they can start turning knobs and dials so that they can uh, more closely match that promised weight of the package. It has serious implications mm-hmm. of what, um, from a profitability standpoint, right? It hits your bottom line. This is an operational efficiency use case. And in this particular case, it was a champion uh, internal at Hershey's that knew that this was a problem they were struggling with, but they didn't know how to solve it. And and so but just give, by just giving us the data and, and a chance to experiment and uh, provide per, perform learning on the data, we were able to help them drive some really great business outcomes. And so I, I think the lesson of that is, you know, number one, um, we take a lot of stuff for granted. Number two, there's a lot of latent pain in business processes that we might not know how to solve. Um, but three, it's through data that we can address some of these things. And so by figuring out what your Twizzler problem is, that is where I would start thinking about how do I look at IoT? How start evaluating where IoT might provide value for my business if I have a Twizzler problem, um, it, you know, your version of the Twizzler problem or your version of the, the dairy problem, mm-hmm. you know, the, the, the cattle yield challenge. Um, so I would start looking at that and then figure out how the data can help me solve that. And do I have all the data that I need to solve it? That's great. Go solve it with the AI technologies that we make available. But if I don't, then we might start augmenting that with I- data coming from IoT devices. That's the, the famous Dean Bethke right there. <laughs> I mean, th- that for me, when I hear stories like that, like it immediately helps me anchor into use cases and anchor into um, almost looking at any business process and starting to look at it almost like in microservices, like mini, mini modular Lego pieces that you can start just looking deeper into like the extruder. Um, and I remember taking a statistics, a statistics class uh, my MBA, and it was a it was a very strange uh, problem where we had to um, uh, forecast uh, just via math, like old school, you know, on a piece of paper, no Excel math, like the variation in macaroni bites, and it was essentially this exact same problem. Like, how do you the the different weight, and if it's a below a certain weight, then it's not good because of the the customer is going to be unhappy. And how do you? But now we have far more advanced ways of of doing these different things because you have all these different elements of machines being connected and they could they could feed into those different data streams yeah and data right we another uh cliche you know data data is the new currency right Mm -hmm. the more data you have the more valuable it is and it's not just that additional piece of data helps is is additive it the value can be exponential because that one additional piece of data is can be that missing puzzle piece that helps you solve the puzzle so I, I think we're just going to keep gathering more and more data. There's going to be more creative ways and uh, to gather that data. Mm-hmm. And it's going to become easier and easier as more of our dumb things become smart and smart things become smarter. Incredible. Um, so what, what kind of books are on your nightstand before we let you go? Like wh- what's... <laughs> oh, it's, it's all like non-technology stuff. Perfect. I, I need to get lost in... <laughs> uh, I, I'm, I'm a big like... Um, either like a historical fiction genre or detective novels, things that I can just sort of get lost in and distract myself, uh, distract myself with. Otherwise it's, you know, looking at this news feed, finding things that are interesting and then jumping into particular topics that, that um, I find compelling, or I think there might be use for me in business or my personal life. Uh, If you could choose one sci-fi character from a movie that, you just want want to be or look up to, and I'm I'm choosing sci-fi because it, you're a geek at heart. Oh, I don't. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sci-fi. Um, I don't I don't know, man. I I am frankly, uh, this might this might kill the podcast, but I, I guess I'm just not that big of a science fiction fan. Uh, so I don't I don't know that I've got a great sci-fi character. How about a? I mean, it could even be as wide and have as much breadth as Indiana Jones. Any any character. Uh, <laughs> I don't know, man. Well, I'll have to think about that one. Okay, we'll get back to that. All right. Well, hey, Dean, uh, really appreciate you coming on. And um, what's the best way for folks to get a hold of you? 
Sure. Uh, it's just Dean B at Microsoft.com. D E A N B at Microsoft.com. Great. And I'll, I'll go ahead and I'll also put your um, LinkedIn profile into the show notes as well. Thanks, sir. This was great. Thanks a lot, sir. 